and he follows it up uh, in the uh, encyclical another ten years later, and he says, "What's the most? What is the cause of wealth?" Now, no pope would ever ask that question, but of course Adam Smith had. But Adam Smith was all alone in philosophical history. Nobody ever asks, "How could you create more wealth?" And it's the fruitful question. To ask what are the causes of poverty is is idle. I mean, okay, suppose you find out the causes of poverty. Terrific! Now you know how to make more poverty. I mean, it's it's a useless question. Um, the really interesting question is how do you create wealth? Because if you can create wealth, then there's absolutely no need for poverty. And Adam Smith is the first man in history to imagine a world in which there is no poverty. Universal affluence was the term he gave it. I mean, that's a dynamite idea. And um, well, anyway, there was Pope John Paul II in paragraph 31 of, uh, or 32 of Tantasimus Honest, the 100th year, the 100th year after Leo XIII's first encyclical. Um, the cause of the wealth of nations is primarily um, knowledge, skill, know-how. It's just an amazing transformation of terms. Transformation and giving capital a new meaning, uh, and then just straightening out a whole battery of terms. Uh, he did the same thing with personal initiative. Um, he talked about how one of the great abuses under uh, under communism was the destruction of personal initiative, and he he thought of that as a as a natural right. We're made in the image. The, the, the biblical text that appealed to him most was Genesis and creation, the creation story, not the liberation story of the liberation of the illusions. That story is most human beings on earth are oppressed, overthrow their oppressors. He didn't see it that way, John Paul II. Rather that uh, God created and endowed in us the capacities to create and our task together is to create uh, wealth and uh, law and, and a free society. And, and for that matter, the praise to God, the, the religious liberty. So um, I, all, all my life I've tried to take words like self-interest. Um, self-interest was invented by the economists of the 18th century. And I myself think it was to put a thumb in the nose, in the eyes of the theologians and the moralists. Because when moralists say self-interest, they always mean greed, selfishness. But from the point of view of an economist, if your interest is prayer, then go ahead and pray. Uh, if that means more to you than anything in the world, you have a right uh, to do that. Or as Jesus says, what does it profit you if you gain the whole world and suffer the loss of your soul? Well, that's a, an appeal to profit. What, what does profit you? And if it's your self-interest to live the Gospels and to make the sacrifices required and so forth, that's good. Self-interests are not always evil. Self-interests are good. If I want to learn Latin or Greek, I've got to set aside the time to do and go through the conjugations and declensions and learn how to speak these difficult languages. I got to put in, put in the effort. But that's my self-interest. I want to be a different kind of person. You know, that's not bad. Self-interest is, okay, I'm, I'm overdoing it, but the point is self-interest is a neutral word. It can be bad, it can be good, it can be just neutral. But it's not, a, it's not an evil word, it's not pejorative. And the economists who are trying to make that point, unfortunately, um, Polemically, uh, 